The Cthulhu Mythos Timeline 15 billion years ago Before the universe and the beginning of time, there was the primordial chaos, raging endless sea of nuclear corruption, making and devouring itself for endless eons. Then, a sound of a flute piping was heard. With its eldritch music the chaos went calmer, and the flute became stronger. There was a brief moment of silence, then the sound of Azathoth was heard. I am Azathoth. I am what you call God. I am the creator, the nuclear sultan. I am your father and the father of everyone and everything. With my other hands I created everything, and with these hands I will destroy everything. Then the great slumber began. This was later known as the Big Bang. May his slumber be endless. 4.5 billion years ago, the planet Earth forms. Its molten surface attracted eldritch horror from the depth of space. That is Thugga and its fire vampires arrived on the Earth as it cools. Thugga was first envisioned in the dreams of August Derleth. He was first mentioned in Derleth's short story The House on Kerwin Street 1943, but did not appear until Derleth's The Dweller in Darkness 1944. Thugga is a great old one, an elemental spirit of fire. In The Dark Mirror by John Glasby it was mentioned as, he hung motionless in a black, forbidding sky and at first thought he was suspended somewhere in the intrasolar depths much closer to the sun than on earth. But then he realized that the dully gleaming orb which floated before his dreaming vision was not the sun ugly dark blotches modeled the dull orange surface and great columns of spinning flame arced around the rim. He watched, the titan sunspots drift slowly across the hideous disk, at times growing larger and merging into great gaping chasms in the fiery atmosphere, while at others dwindling almost to nothingness, something was stirring deep within that fiery atmosphere, something monstrous that roared in insatiable anger against the chains of the elder gods which had bound it there for an eternity, unable to resist. Utterly powerless to control his movements, he was diving headlong towards that ravening, Chaos, that age-old intelligence which was Thugga. The fire vampires accompanied Thugga and acted as his servants. The fire vampires are living extensions of the cosmic entity known as Thagwa, may be Thugga progeny. Traveling the cosmos in their interstellar ship, the Tinga, they appear as bluish electrical discharges resembling lightning. They feast upon the life energy of sentient creatures. The victim will burst into flames during this process, with the fire vampires consuming their essence and memories using heat instead of internal metabolization. These stolen memories are added to Thagwa's gestalt consciousness, allowing them to learn better and adapt to consuming more. Both the fire vampires and Thagwa were first envisioned by Donald Wandre. The fire vampires lurked in the depth of Earth millions of years until Thagwa arrived on Earth attempting to subjugate it. These events were detailed in Donald Wandre's story The Fire Vampire. Next is a brief summary of it. The Fire Vampires In the distant future, a united federation of nations historian named Alan Marsdale reminisces on an apocalyptic event involving a comet. A man named Gustav Norby, an authority on cosmic lifeforms, warned of impending danger from a comet coming on July 7, 2321 but people laughed off his claims. Dubbed Norby's Comet, noted for its reddish-blue coloration, it was projected to arrive in 18 years. But on August 10th, on its arrival to Alpha Centauri, it mysteriously vanished, then appeared four days later a billion miles beyond Pluto, perplexing the astronomers and the public, and prompting theories that it was controlled by other lifeforms. The revelation that it would appear near Earth in 16 hours, its approach visible in the sky prompted reactions from panic to wonderment. Later the comet mysteriously changed course, moving in the opposite direction of Earth's rotation. The comet orbited and illuminated the world, and after a complete orbit exited in the direction of Antares. On August 16th, Norby and his assistant Hugh argued that, because the comet followed no natural laws, it could return again, as it might have merely been observing Earth like a satellite. Records showed that thousands died under the comet's orbit via spontaneous combustion after a strike of lightning, leaving nothing but bones, and that this phenomenon is still occurring. 
Six years later in August, Norby and Hugh, after photographing a new star in the Antares cluster, came across a sentient fireball in a tree of the same color as the comet. They observed in horror as the new creature consumed people in fire with fingers of lightning and forced them to hide in the observatory. The two realized that this predatory lightning and fire had arrived on Earth from Norby's comet, and that the new star in the Antares cluster was the comet planning its next move. The two learned on the news that these fire vampires were killing people around the world, arriving through electric bolts of lightning. Later that night, the comet returned, appearing first in China. The comet formed mile-long fiery letters in the sky, spelling a message in appropriate languages over each country. People of Earth, you are ours by right of conquest. Henceforth and forever you belong to us, of Tinga, known to you as Norby's Comet. You cannot fight us, nor defeat us, nor evade us. We are superior to you in every way. At irregular intervals, we shall return and claim as our due from twenty to fifty thousand of your inhabitants. We desire nothing else. But we insist upon the payment, and we shall take it. If you resist, we shall take more. On our next visit, we shall claim John Hamby, the President of the Federated Nations, Axel Gruno, Master Scientist of the World, Sin Lo Hoi, Commander-in-Chief of the International Army, Gustav Norby, of the Mount Wilson Observatory. These men must place themselves in the evening of August 27, 2332, at the peak of Mount Wilson. If they are not there, we shall take 100,000 lives instead of 20. Thagwa, Lord of Tinga. Convinced this is a hoax, he recommended fighting, but Norby notes that these creatures are pure energy and cannot be opposed easily. They even fed on heart, mind, and soul, absorbing knowledge from those they consume, which is how they learn to communicate with humans. Norby believes that they fear him because he poses a threat to them for warning of the dangers beforehand, and so he seeks to prepare for their arrival in the next five years. Five years later, Norby planned to have three of the specified people arrive to fulfill Thagwa's request, while he would pretend to be dead. When a witness who had seen Norby alive was consumed, the fire vampire discovered the ruse. In retaliation, 100,000 were killed immediately. The fire vampires take Hanby, Bruno, and Hoy, saying they will return on July 17, 2339, threatening to wipe out all of America unless Norby was handed over. Norby and Hugh tracked the comet's movement via their telescope, and found on it a fortress with alien geometry, large enough to hold thousands of fire vampires. Norby spots a weakness, but doesn't disclose it. In the next five years, weapons were devised to harm the fire vampires, and a massive evacuation, especially in America, was underway to other planets. Overpopulation caused pandemonium, protests, and intermittent warfare. Norby was branded a coward and traitor for causing 100,000 deaths. On the specified date of July 27, 2339, Norby stood inside a crater where the observatory had been, as the detonation of several tons of dynamite made it look like a volcanic eruption. Hugh stood in the center of the crater on a large flat boulder, with a labyrinth of machinery behind him including peculiar dynamos. In front of him was an electron interferometry to detect high electrical discharges and an important triple switch. When the comet finally arrived, Hugh flicked the switch, sending Norby down a hidden trapdoor, with the elaborate machine successfully imprisoning the attacking fire vampires. Then a chain reaction connected itself to Thagwa, and a powerful discharge killed him and all the fire vampires on Earth leading the comet to orbit the planet. Norby said that Thagwa was a unified organism of all the fire vampires, which were merely living limbs for him, and thus if he was destroyed, so were all the fire vampires. He had guessed that pure energy would be effective against a being of pure energy. He claimed he couldn't help but respect an entity that almost succeeded. Three billion years ago, According to the Eltdown Shards, which are an archaeological discovery, depicted as a collection of pottery fragments that preserve pre-human writing, according to the Eltdown Shards, 
a Yucubian cube landed on a planet near the Milky Way galaxy's rim about 3 billion years ago. This planet could be Earth. The hieroglyphs contain similarities to portions of the Nicotic manuscripts because it is written in the language of the Elder Things. The shards describe beings that could exchange minds across space-time, Yithians and Yucubians, how the mind-swapping technology of the Yucubians landed on Earth during the Yithians' rule, and the action they took against it. Also included is a way to contact the Yithians. The fifth shard mentions Avaloth, Athaqua, and his temple. Other mentioned beings are Neftal and Auron Aten. Two billion years ago, Sean or Fawn incarnates in a primitive form on Earth. It evolves itself over the coming millennia. Sean or Fawn is a vampiric elephant like humanoid horror with a leech like mouth on the end of his trunk. When he hungers, Sean or moves very quickly for his size and uses his trunk to drain the blood from his victims, hence his nickname, the Feeder. This entity was first envisioned by Frank Belknap long in the horror from the hills. It was described in the following excerpt. Words could not adequately convey the repulsiveness of the thing. It was endowed with a trunk and great, uneven ears, and two enormous tusks protruded from the corners of its mouth. But it was not an elephant. Indeed, its resemblance to an actual elephant was, at best, sporadic and superficial despite certain unmistakable points of similarity. The ears were webbed and tentacled, the trunk terminated in a huge flaring disc at least a foot in diameter, and the tusks, which intertwined and interlocked at the base of the statue, were as translucent as rock crystal. This knowledge was introduced in the horror from the hills. Next is a brief summary of its events. The Horror from the Hills the novel concerns the elephantine great old one Sean or Fawn. Algernon Harris was the curator of archaeology at the Manhattan Museum of Fine Arts. He sent his field workers to the most primitive and dangerous parts of the world for artifacts. Not all came back unscathed, and two returned inexplicably mutilated. A third, Clark Ullman, returned with a stone idol, of hideous appearance, and with his face concealed with a scarf. The idol resembled an elephant more than anything else. The pedestal was also of an ugly, unidentifiable stone. Richardson had spoken of it in an account of the tortures he endured at the hands of its subhuman worshippers. Ullman was made to take the idol back to civilization to fulfill an ancient prophecy. Ullman also said that Sean or Fawn was not just an idol, but the god himself and that he attacked Ullman in the night and fed on his blood. Shauner Fawn's high priest and spokesman explained to Ullman that Shauner and his five brothers once lived in an inaccessible cave in the Pyrenees, served by humanids that Shauner created, the Miri Nigri. They received human sacrifices from the people of Pompolo until the Romans wiped them out. Shauner Fawn and his brothers then destroyed Pompolo, and the former then moved to Asia to await the white acolyte, Ullman. Ullman was bidden to convey the idol to civilization and warned that Shauner had put a sacrament on him that, if he made to destroy or dispose of the idol, he would rot away in moments. Ullman rambled on about theories of alien life prior to the organic life that now inhabits Earth, and to convince Algernon to unveil his mutilated face. In the midst of arguing about whether his now inhuman face was the work of Shauner Fawn or that of an acolyte, Ullman collapsed and died. Ullman's face now had an elephantine trunk and huge ears, hardly explainable by disease or plastic surgery, and his body was already beginning to decay. After the inquest, the idol was put on display in the museum. Algernon and museum president Scholard very soon afterwards had to investigate the murder of Mr. Sinney, a guard. The man had been found, drained of blood, his face mutilated beyond recognition, and the idol's proboscis was dripping with blood. They also interviewed a Chinese laundry boss who was guided by a dream to come to the museum and be eaten by Shauner. When they examined the idol, they found that the trunk had moved since yesterday. After some discussion, they consult a certain Roger Little. At the same time papers reported a massacre in the Pyrenees, with gigantic footprints ranged around the fourteen dead headless peasants. 
Roger Little was formerly a criminal investigator and now a mystic recluse who had even seen mythos phenomena. He also relates a dream about Pompolo's destruction. The text here is taken almost verbatim from a November 1927 letter by Lovecraft to a Mr. Bernard Dwyer relating one of his dreams. The trio now get a phone call from the museum that Sean or Fawn had left the museum and is now roaming the streets of Manhattan. It was then that Roger Little, seeing the time had come to act, revealed his anti-entropy ray. The machine is indescribably complex, and so are its motions when switched on. Algernon swore he saw a face appear in the whirling parts, just before a ray shot out and bathed the wall. Little shuts the ray off before the wall would have dissolved into its original components. Little explains that the ray reverses entropy, sends anything it hits, back through time, and he hopes that Shauner, bathed in the ray, will return to its original form and go back to where he came from, before entropy over Earth's Ian shaped him the way he is now. The machine is portable, and so they intend to pursue Shauner. Shauner Fawn had attacked and mangled five people, and Hurt thinks the machine is just a hypnotizer, and Algernon plays the ray on the wall until it dissolves to convince him otherwise. Apologizing to Little for damaging his apartment, the three set out to stop Shauner's rampage. Police reports of murders guide the trio to where Shauner Fawn had gone, to the New Jersey seacoast. Shauner would have stood his ground and attacked them, but the ray proved painful and forced him to turn and run. A bathhouse, a turtle and seashells vanished in the ray, and Shauner's geological ancientness alone enabled it to survive. They figure it would take 10 to 15 minutes for the ray to do its work on him. Shauner is unable to move fast enough. When his feet get caught in the shore mire, and the ray is played on him, and the three endure its awful bellowing. Before their eyes, Shauner de-evolves and slowly, horribly disincarnates. Shauner, after many transformations, reverts to a mantle of glowing slime, and finally fades away. Shauner, now an expanding force in the sky, reappears and tries to grab the three who hurt it so, but then vanishes, the dawn comes. At the same time, Shauner's five brothers also vanished in the Pyrenees before they could do any further havoc leaving five pools of rotten slime. This meant that Shauner and his brothers were actually connected hyperdimensionally. Though Shauner is now gone, Little ponders the possibility that he may someday, after ages, return to ravage again. One billion years ago. The beginning of the Elder Age. Abu Sathla and the Elder Things appeared on Earth. It's hard to predict who preceded the other. However, we do believe that Abosathla arrival on Earth attracted the Elder Things. Abosathla, also known as the Unbegotten Source and the Demiurge, is one of the ancient beings known collectively as the Outer Gods. It is described as a huge protoplasmic mass resting in a grotto deep beneath the frozen Earth. The being is of a monstrous fecundity, spontaneously generating primordial single-celled organisms that pour unceasingly from its shapeless form. It guards a set of stone tablets believed to contain the knowledge of the Elder Gods. Abosathla is said to have spawned the prototypes of all forms of life on Earth, though whatever its pseudopods touch is forever devoid of life. Abosathla is destined to someday reabsorb all living things on Earth. Abosathla possibly dwells in Ika. The being may also dwell in Mount Vurmathadreth and may have spawned another of its residents, the being Abhoth whose form and nature is very similar. This similarity has led some writers to speculate that Abosathla and Abhoth are the same entity viewed at different epochs under different names. The tablets that Abosathla guards have been often sought by sorcerers, though no sorcerer has yet succeeded in acquiring them. Abosathla is described in the book of Ibn it reads, For Abosathla is the source and the end. Before the coming of Zothakwa or Yaxothoth or Tholhut from the stars, Abosathla dwelt in the steaming fens of the new made earth, a mass without head or members, spawning the grey, formless Fs of the prime and the grisly prototypes of terrene life. And all earthly life, it is told, shall go back at last through the great circle of time to Abosathla. Abosathla was first envisioned by Clark Ashton Smith in a story with the same name. 
It is about a man that stumbles across an unusual orb in a small curio stand, recognizing it as the crystal of Zon Metzimelech, a relic of lost Hyperborea. Upon bringing it home, he feels compelled to use it, and finds that it can transport him back in time. Over the coming days he travels farther and farther back, his consciousness merging with that of the sorcerer Zon Metzimelech, and reaching the source of all life on earth, the entity known as Abosatha. There, his shattered mind and metamorphosed body settles down amongst the other amoeboid creatures excreted by the monster. 900 million years ago. By then the Elder Things had colonized the oceans, their civilization however did not reach its peak until later on. They spent the next 100 million years studying the knowledge of Abosathla. The Elder Things are first envisioned by H.P. Lovecrafts in the Mountains of Madness. This excerpt describes them, it reads, Six feet end to end, three and five tenths feet central diameter, tapering to one foot at each end. Like a barrel with five bulging ridges in place of staves. Lateral breakages, as of thinnish stalks, are at equator in the middle of these ridges. In furrows between ridges are curious growth combs or wings that fold up and spread out like fans, which gives almost a seven-foot wing spread. Arrangement reminds one of certain monsters of primal myth especially fabled elder things in the Necronomicon. Another excerpt tells us of their society and life, it reads. In furnishing their homes they kept everything in the center of the huge rooms, leaving all the wall spaces free for decorative treatment. Lighting, in the case of the land inhabitants, was accomplished by a device probably electrochemical in nature. Both on land and underwater they used curious tables, chairs and couches like cylindrical frames, for they rested and slept upright with folded down tentacles and racks for hinged sets of dotted surfaces forming their books. Government was evidently complex and probably socialistic, though no certainties in this regard could be deduced from the sculptures we saw. There was extensive commerce, both local and between different cities, certain small, flat counters, five-pointed and inscribed, serving as money. Probably the smaller of the various greenish soapstones found by our expedition were pieces of such currency. Though the culture was mainly urban, some agriculture and much stock raising existed. Mining and a limited amount of manufacturing were also practiced. Travel was very frequent, but permanent migration seemed relatively rare except for the vast colonizing movements by which the race expanded. For personal locomotion no external aid was used, since in land, air, and water movement alike the old ones seemed to possess excessively vast capacities for speed. Loads, however, were drawn by beasts of burden, shagas under the sea, and a curious variety of primitive vertebrates in the later years of land existence. 800 million years ago With the knowledge given by Abosathla the Elder Things civilization reached its peak. They adapt to land. Many remain in the oceans, however. They created precursors to all earth life, yet their greatest achievement was the creation of the Shagath. With the help of the Shagath that acted like their slave, the Elder Things built their monolithic cities in the land and ocean. The Shagath was first envisioned by H.P. Lovecraft. This excerpt describes them. It reads, Formless protoplasm able to mock and reflect all forms and organs and processes, viscous agglutinations of bubbling cells, rubbery 15-foot spheroids infinitely plastic and ductile, slaves of suggestion, builders of cities, more and more sullen, more and more intelligent, more and more amphibious, more and more imitative. Great God! What madness made even those blasphemous old ones willing to use and carve such things? This knowledge was introduced in H.P. Lovecraft's At the Mountains of Madness. The following is a brief account of its events. At the Mountains of Madness The story is written in the first-person perspective by the geologist William Dyer, a professor from Miskatonic University. He writes to disclose hitherto unknown and closely kept secrets in the hope that he can deter a planned and much-publicized scientific expedition to Antarctica. On a previous expedition there, a party of scholars from Miskatonic University, led by Dyer, 
discovered fantastic and horrific ruins and a dangerous secret beyond a range of mountains taller than the Himalaya. The group that discovered and crossed the mountains found the remains of 14 ancient life forms, completely unknown to science and unidentifiable as either plants or animals, after discovering an underground cave while boring for ice cores. Six of the specimens seemed to be badly damaged, the others uncannily pristine. Their highly evolved features are problematic. Their stratum location puts them at a point on the geologic time scale much too early for such features to have naturally evolved yet. Because of their resemblance to creatures of myth mentioned in the Necronomicon, they are dubbed the Elder Ones. When the main expedition loses contact with this party, Dyer and the rest of his colleagues travel to their camp to investigate. The camp is devastated and both the men and the dogs slaughtered, with only one of each missing. Near the camp, they find six star-shaped snow mounds, and a damaged Elder One buried under each. They discover that the better preserved life forms have vanished and that some form of experiment has been done, though they are only able to speculate on the subject and the possibility that it is the missing man and dog. Dyer decides to close off the area from which they took their samples. Dyer and a student named Danforth fly an airplane over the mountains, which they soon realize are the outer wall of a huge, abandoned stone city of cubes and cones, utterly alien to any human architecture. By exploring these fantastic structures, the men are able to learn the history of the Elder Things or Old Ones by interpreting their magnificent hieroglyphic murals. The Old Ones first came to Earth shortly after the moon was pulled loose from the planet and were the creators of life. They built their cities with the help of Shagaths, organisms created to perform any task, assume any form, and reflect any thought. As more buildings are explored, a fantastic vista opens up the history of races beyond the scope of man's understanding, including the Old Ones' conflicts with the Thulhai and the Migo who arrived on Earth sometime after the Old Ones themselves. Uncannily, the images also reflect a degradation in the order of this civilization, as the Shagaths gain independence. As more resources are applied to maintaining order, the etchings become haphazard and primitive. The murals also allude to some unnamed evil in an even larger mountain range. Just past their city which even they fear greatly. Eventually, as Antarctica became uninhabitable even for the old ones, they migrated into a large, subterranean ocean. As the two progress further into the city, they are ultimately drawn to a massive, ominous entrance which is the opening of a tunnel which they believe leads into the subterranean region described in the murals. Compulsively they are drawn in, finding further horrors, evidence of dead old ones caught in a brutal struggle and blind six-foot-tall penguins wandering around placidly. They are confronted with an immense, ululating horror which they identify as a shagath. They escape with their lives using luck and diversion. On the plain high above the plateau, Danforth looks back and sees something that causes him to lose his sanity. He refuses to tell anyone, even Dyer what he saw, though it is implied that it has something to do with what lies beyond the larger mountain range that even the Old Ones feared. Professor Dyer concludes that the Old Ones and their civilization were destroyed by the Shagaths they created and that this entity has sustained itself on the enormous penguins since eons past. He begs the planners of the next proposed Antarctic expedition to stay away from things that should not be let loose on this earth. 750 million years ago, the flying polyps arrived on Earth. They traveled across space and found Earth around 750 million years ago. On arrival, they constructed bizarre basalt cities wherein numerous high and windowless towers were raised. With their expansion toward the oceans they conflicted with the Elder Things and fought a vicious war that resulted in them being limited to inhabiting the lands. Rumors speak of the polyps also raising cities on three other planets in the solar system, with speculation pointing to Mars, Neptune, and Venus. The flying polyps was first envisioned by H.P. Lovecraft in The Shadow Out of Time. This excerpt describes them, it reads, Such was the fixed mood of horror that the very aspect of the creatures was left unmentioned, and no time was I able to gain a clear hint of what they looked like. There were veiled suggestions of a monstrous plasticity, 
and of temporary lapses of visibility, while other fragmentary whispers referred to their control and military use of great winds. Singular whistling noises and colossal footprints made up of five circular toe marks seemed also to be associated with them. 450 million years ago, fish evolved on Earth. 400 million years ago, the great race of youth projected their minds into a race of cone-shaped creatures on Earth, trying to flee an unknown catastrophe in their home planet Yith. They lived on this planet for 200 million years or so, in fierce competition with the flying polyps, until this enemy finally destroyed their civilization near the close of the Cretaceous era, about 65 million years ago. They trapped them under Earth. On Earth, they built the city Nakotis, located in Australia's Great Sandy Desert. Nakotis holds the Nakotis manuscripts, Yitha's history. The great race of Yith was first envisioned by H.P. Lovecraft. He describes them in this excerpt. The great race's members were immense rugose cones ten feet high, and with head and other organs attached to foot-thick, distensible limbs spreading from the apexes. They spoke by the clicking or scraping of huge paws or claws attached to the end of two of their four limbs, and walked by the expansion and contraction of a viscous layer attached to their vast, ten-foot bases. This knowledge was introduced in H.P. Lovecraft's story The Shadow Out of Time. The following is a brief account of its events. The sh Shadow Out of Time the Shadow Out of Time indirectly tells of the great race of Yith, an extraterrestrial species with the ability to travel through space and time. The Yithians accomplished this by body swap with hosts from the intended spatial or temporal destination. The story implies that the effect when seen from the outside is similar to spiritual possession. The Yithians' original purpose was to study the history of various times and places, and they have amassed a library city that is filled with the past and future history of multiple races, including humans. Ultimately the Yithians used their ability to escape the destruction of their planet in another galaxy by switching bodies with a race of cone-shaped plant beings who lived 250 million years ago on Earth. The cone-shaped entities, subsequently also known as the Great Race of Yith, lived in their vast library city in what would later become Australia's Great Sandy Desert. The story is told through the eyes of Nathaniel Wingate Peasley, an American living in the first decade of the 20th century, who is, possessed, by a Yithian. He fears he is losing his mind when he unaccountably sees strange vistas of other worlds and of the Yithian library city. He also feels himself being led about by these creatures and experiences how they live. When he is returned to his own body, he finds that those around him have judged him insane due to the actions of the Yithian that possessed his body. While he was experiencing a Yithian existence in Earth's ancient past, the Yithian occupying his body was experiencing a human one in the present day. The narrator at first believes his episode and subsequent dreams to be the product of some kind of mental illness. His initial relief at discovering other cases like his throughout history is withered when he discovers that the other cases are too similar to his own to be without a connection. The narrator's dreams become more vivid, and he becomes obsessed with archaeology and ancient manuscripts, as was the Yithian, but lacks any sort of proof that would demonstrate whether he was simply mad. He discovers that the Yithians on Earth died out eons ago, their civilization destroyed by a rival utterly alien pre-human race described as half polypus creatures, but the Yithian minds will inhabit new bodies on Earth after humanity is long gone. His tenuously held sanity is challenged when he discovers the proof he seeks, and that not only do remains of the Yithian's past civilization still exist on Earth, but also those still remaining are those who destroyed them. It is also mentioned that the current appearance of the Yithians is not the original but one acquired during a previous mass projection of the minds of their race when disaster beckoned, leaving the original inhabitants to die in the bodies of the Yithians. 400 million years ago At the edge of the solar system, the space-time shattered, yag opened the gate from the Migo homeworld to Yegath, known to men as Pluto. This ushered the arrival of the Fungi, and a new era for Earth. Their purpose is not fully understood. 
However, it was speculated they arrived to mine rare metallic ores and minerals from Yugath and nearby planets. 380 million years ago. The Migo first arrived on Earth. The events that follow are best described in this excerpt of the Necronomicon. It was the prayers of the fungi of Yugath that brought havoc into our world. Beings with a vast empire reaching beyond the stars, with its closest outpost on Pluto, otherwise known as Yugath. These beings resemble winged crustaceans with egg-shaped heads that constantly change color, their chief means of communication. The fungi showed a great deal of interest in our planet, because Earth contains deposits of certain minerals that are not found in other parts of the universe, or at least gates to other dimensions with these deposits. These substances are used to grow the fungi that they use as food. To obtain these minerals, they came to Earth eons ago seeking to make the planet their own. But despite how young Earth was, it wasn't an empty home. For the Elder Things were there before. The Elder Things came to our planet when it was still young, flying to our world through outer space, possibly from Uranus or Neptune. Previously, they had conquered and seeded hundreds of other worlds with life. They built a great city near the South Pole, and migrated from there to settle much of the planet. While performing these feats of colonization, they may have created Abosathla, the source of all earthly life, a servitor race, the Shagats, and many forms of earthly life, including humans. As strong as the race of Yagath were, they were no match for the Elder Things, for their body is harder than steel and their magic is blessed by the crawling chaos, Nyarlathotep. And more and more the Shagath. The formless protoplasm able to mock and reflect all forms and organs and processes, viscous agglutinations of bubbling cells, rubbery 15-foot spheroids infinitely plastic and ductile, slaves of suggestion, builders of cities, more and more sullen, more and more intelligent, more and more amphibious, more and more imitative. Great God! What madness made even those blasphemous old ones willing to use and carve such things? The skirmish was brief as the Elder Things obliterated the invading fungi, but what was to come was far greater than what the Elder Things had foreseen. For the race of Yugath gives the greatest honor apart from their moon to yag sothoth whose existence is in unending harmony with all dimensions and all continuance. But the creatures of Yugath call him in their own tongue of flashing colored lights him who lies beyond, or the transcendent lord. The Migo remaining in our world in the highlands of the East continue to serve him, and act as his agents and messengers. 370 million years ago, amphibians evolved on Earth. When Sean or Fawn dwelled in Western Europe along with his brothers, he created the Miri Nigri from the flesh of toads. The Miri Nigri are mute semi-human dwarves. Their normal behavior is to serve Sean or Fawn without question or hesitation and in silence. They are usually found crawling over the great old one's body. Twice a year they descend from the hills to abduct young men and women on whose blood their master can feast. Although their first appearance was in the horror from the hills, by Frank Belknap Long, the Miri Nigri actually originate from a dream of H.P. Lovecraft. While writing the horror from the hills, Long incorporated Lovecraft's description of his dream, with Lovecraft's permission, into the story. 360 million years ago. The star spawn of Cthulhu was conceived. Are a species that have a physical similarity with the great old one Cthulhu, but are of far smaller size. This knowledge was found in this excerpt of the Necronomicon. It was then at his temple at Vural that Yagsatha summoned his high priest, the warrior god Cthulhu. Cthulhu is ever a warrior god and of all the old ones he is the most terrible. For it is his delight to slay and lay waste to everything that lies beneath his feet. And the very lust to conquer what was once free drives him onward across the heavens and through the spheres. Despite all this it was yag wisdom that foresaw the trouble lying ahead, for Cthulhu alone is no match for the servants of the crawling chaos. Yagsathoth opened the gate to Shabnigirath, 
great Cthulhu lay with her and bred upon her the armies that overthrew the elder things. For the manner of her bringing forth is not one after the way of women, nor even a score after the way of mice, but myriads of myriads of children issue from her womb, which never closes. It has been ages since she last lay with her cousin. 350 million years ago. The First Cataclysm Cthulhu and his star spawn arrived on Earth from Zoth. They fought a war against the Elder Things, and then the Migo ruled the Earth. This knowledge was introduced in this excerpt of the Necronomicon. It was he together with his star spawn that defeated the Elder Things, who had long possessed the sovereignty of this world before he descended on his gray and leathern wings through the upper gate opened by yog -Sothoth. As hungry wolves on an unguarded flock they fell and crushed the great stones of the barrier walls of the elder cities into sand. Even the Shagaths were driven as chaff in the wind before their fury. Who can measure the strength of a Shagath? Yet it is whispered by ancient things that dwell in the depths that its strength was without avail against the might of this god. Into the sea the elder ones fled, little dreaming that through the changes of fortune and the passage of ages they would once again walk the frozen stones of their greatest city far to the south, and Cthulhu would lie trapped beneath the waves in the sea. Long eons the old ones reigned in our world after the vanquishing of the elder race, their palaces and cities secure under the protection of Cthulhu and his armies. No foe could defeat him, save only time itself for the heavens revolve unceasingly in their courses and care nothing for the will of men or gods. For time the Migo inherited the earth, and set up mining bases in the Andes, the Appalachians, and the Himalayas. Such bases are usually hidden, word of their actions usually spreads despite this secrecy, and references to these curious creatures are often found in the legends of the countryside surrounding the creatures' lairs. Their bodies sometimes appear after floods, as Migo drown if submerged in water, adding substance to the local folklore. Myths ranging from those of the Calican sorrows of Greece to the Nagas of India and Tibet have been attributed to contacts with these beings. As the cold crept over their Antarctic home, the Elder Things decided that they wanted no more to do with the outer world. They removed themselves to a vast underground lake beneath their first and greatest city in the mountains near the pole. No traces of them have been discovered since. End of excerpt. The Deep Ones are speculated to have followed Great Cthulhu to Earth from outer space. Thus, they served as allies of Cthulhu and his kin, Star Spawn of Cthulhu, probably fighting numerous wars with rivaling species and helping build the city of Raya. Following the defeat of Cthulhu and the sinking of the city Raya, they were left alone and traveled around the world, establishing city-like colonies. The Kayanyanians. With Cthulhu's arrival on Earth, the Kayanyanians were brought across space from a planet much like Earth. They are human looking immortal alien beings, intelligent and aristocratic. They founded a mighty civilization spanning as far as the South Pole near the mountain of Kadath. When the continent of Mu sank, they decided to hole up in their underground shelter, believing survivors on the outside to be in league with space devils. Though at one point the Great Expanse had once been home to several races, the men of Tsath managed to conquer and subdue them, going on to forcibly breed them with the creatures of Yath. After a million or two years belief in the old legends faded and rare visitors like Samakona Y. Ninyas were allowed to enter to be questioned about the world above, but could never leave. This knowledge was first envisioned by H. P. Lovecraft in his story The Mound. The following is a brief account of its events. The Mound The story is narrated by an ethnologist who visits the town of Binger, Oklahoma in 1928 to investigate certain stories related to a certain nearby mound, which is said to be haunted by a strange Indian man by day and a headless woman by night. The local people avoid the place, and there are strange stories of those who dared to venture there either disappearing, or returning insane and inexplicably altered. Being initially quite skeptical, the narrator brings some archaeological tools and visits the mound, noticing that the man pacing it appears closest to the native Indians, but cannot be identified with any known Indian tribe. 
Through a talisman made of a strange metal given to him by a local chieftain, he unearths a strange cylinder made of the same unidentifiable metal full of hideous engravings and strange hieroglyphics. Upon discovering a scroll written in Spanish in the cylinder, the narrator returns to his host and begins to translate it. The contents of the scroll, covering a large part of the narrative, describe the travels of Juan Panfilo de Zamacona y Nunez, an Asturian explorer, almost 400 years prior. Zamacona recounts how he was a part of an expedition from Mexico to North America, and how, through the help of a native Indian, he discovered a vast underground world filled with grotesque temples, and populated by strange beasts and a highly advanced telepathic civilization who worshipped Cthulhu, Yig, Shubnigirath, and, until a certain incident, Sithagwa. The members of the underground race who lived in what they called the Kingdom of Nyan welcomed him, but the more Zamakona learned about them, the more fearful he became. The Nyanians had attained immortality and subjugated other races before them, had the technology to biologically modify vanquished races and other life forms and reanimate the dead for use as slaves, and could dematerialize and rematerialize at will. The underground people also engaged in sadism, depraved practices, ritualistic orgies and unspeakable horrors such as random body modifications and mutilations of other slave species as entertainment, in order to gratify their time-dulled senses. The natives kept Samakona alive only because they wished to learn more about the outside world from him, under the condition that he would never return to the surface. As Zamakona observed their decaying social condition and their reactions to his telling them of the surface people, he feared that they would one day decide to invade the outside world, where, given their advanced powers, they would be unstoppable. Eventually, Zamakona attempted to escape with Tialayub, a female Nyanian native who knew of an unguarded entrance to the surface world, carrying with him a cylinder containing a scroll that recorded his story which he hoped would warn the surface world of the underground threat. However, he was betrayed by one of his biologically modified slave creatures and was captured. Tialayub was sentenced to unspeakable tortures and mutilations at the amphitheater and ended up a decapitated YMB guarding the entrance, the headless woman in Ms. Bishop's brief synopsis, while Zamakona was spared because they wished to extract more of his knowledge. Later on, he attempted another escape which apparently resulted in the cylinder containing the scroll being deposited on the mound. His narrative ends quite hurriedly and abruptly. The narrator is shocked by this scroll but remains skeptical, so the next day he goes to the mound again for further investigation, repeatedly telling himself that this is an elaborate hoax. Upon digging in a depression on the mound, he discovers a staircase leading deep underground, where he encounters dematerialized beings patrolling the tunnel, they are prevented from making the narrator one more victim by the talisman of unidentifiable metal and eventually a fully material entity at the sight of which his nerves completely break down, sending him fleeing wildly back to the surface. That entity is revealed to be the completely mutilated and reanimated corpse of Zamakona with a message inscribed onto his chest in broken Spanish by the underground race. 300 million years ago. The second cataclysm. A cosmic cataclysm, possibly a certain configuration occurs, resulting in Laia sinking beneath the waves. The Elder Things sealed Cthulhu within the city. In all likelihood, the other Great Old Ones are imprisoned around the same time. This knowledge is introduced in this excerpt of the Necronomicon. The stars do not always remain right but for brief periods in their endless turnings they assume the angles of the same rays they shed down in the primordial dawn of the world. The stars became poisonous to the old ones in our world, and so they withdrew in bitter rage to bide their purpose until the sky was once more wholesome, yet Cthulhu would not depart from the lands he had conquered. He devised a work of potent magic that would keep him safe within the house he had made for himself on the mountain that overshadowed his island city of Laia. It was then that vengeance was enacted three members of the elder race came to Laia in secret and placed the seal upon the entrance to his tomb. So that after waking he would be trapped for unnumbered ages, for
for they foresaw the sinking of the city with their astronomical arts and placed the seal on the eve of the cataclysm. In this way they thought to frustrate Cthulhu, for he cannot wake from his sleep of death until the door is opened, and the seal cannot be breached by either he or his spawn. Yet with all their wisdom they did not consider the rise of our race. And it may prove that at some future time the ingenuity of man can unlock the gate that holds impotent the might of the god. The stars do not always remain poisonous. Then does Raya rise upwards so that the house of Cthulhu emerges into the air. The mind of the god waxes strong, and he uses its power to send forth to men who are susceptible to his influence the command that they release the seals that bind his tomb for it is his single weakness that he cannot release himself from sleep but must rely upon hands of flesh to shatter the seals. As though in bitter jest, the stars never remain right for more than a handful of days, and always in the past, before the men enslaved by the god can reach distant Laia, their fatal conflux of lights permits Raya to sink once more, severing the bond between the will of Cthulhu and the flesh of those he has enthralled leaving them to wail in confusion and despair upon the bosom of the vacant sea. On the walls of lost cities and in the carvings of madmen who have glimpsed him in their dreams is the form of the god delineated. All this was in the ancient times, and in the age of man Cthulhu lies dreaming in Raya, his spawn has vanished, and the Migo are returned to Yegath, all but a few that watch and wait. The tale is whispered that at some future time the stars will move in their courses and align as they have in the past, but at last their pattern will endure and the world will become wholesome for the old ones. Cthulhu will rise and conquer, as is his right, for what force of gods or men can stand against his fury. Until that day, may it never be witnessed, I give a greatest honor and build the most sacred temple for our elder ancestor, for them we have a future ahead. 275 million years ago. Reptiles evolved on Earth. Yig is involved in their creation. The serpent people first appeared. They are a non-human species which, although possessing somewhat humanoid limbs, strongly resembles snakes. They founded the kingdom of Volusia. Between 250 and 200 million years ago. According to the Garn fragments the city of Garn had been built. Garn is a prehuman city located deep in the jungles of Central Africa which, if the Garn fragments are correct, existed since the Triassic period. Garn was most likely an outpost of the Elder Things. At a later time, the great old one Shadamel and his children, the Clonians, were imprisoned with the Elder Sion at Garn until they were freed by meddling shamans and natural disasters. The cult of Nafrakov fled to this city after the High Priest's death and Garn was the objective of Sir Wendy Smith's last expedition, which left the noted archaeologist mentally unstable. This knowledge was first envisioned by Brian Lumley in his story Cement Surroundings. The following is a brief account of its events. Cement Surroundings The story introduces Garn, a lost prehuman city somewhere in Africa. The location is otherwise unspecified. I did not wish to know, not even remotely, the whereabouts of dead Garn. The narrator Paul Wendy Smith notes, but the tendency of Clonians to travel in straight lines suggests a West African location. Garn is a legendary city which Sir Amory believed had existed centuries before the foundations were cut for the pyramids. Man's primal ancestors were not yet conceived when Garnes towering ramparts first reared their monolithic sculptings to pre dawn skies. Sir Amory refers to it as a buried land where Shud Amel broods and bubbles, plotting the destruction of the human race and the release from his watery prison of Great Cthulhu. Most of the story takes place in Yorkshire, where Sir Amory had a cottage that his nephew Paul came to stay at near the town of Rakar. Rakar also features in Lumley's story, The Sister City. It's noted as the home of the Rakar Recorder newspaper whose sub-editor Mr. McKinnon is said to be particularly helpful. The cottage is also said to be nearby to Marski, a motorist who witnesses its destruction speeds into Marski to report it. Paul takes a new house on the outskirts of Marski in order to be close if his uncle should reappear but this house too is destroyed. 
There are two villages named Marski in Yorkshire, one in Richmondshire near the centerline of the island, and the other, known as Marski by the Sea, on the North Sea shore. Marski by the Sea is near the real world town of Redcar. It's tempting to imagine that Radcar is Lumley's spelling for Redcar, but the pattern of tremors noted in the story, leading from Tinterton in Kent through Ramsey and Huntingdonshire to Ghoul in Yorkshire, points to the interior Marski as the one intended, and to Radcar as a fictional location. Sir Amory's notes refer to other locations as foci of eldritch activity particularly Avebury in Wiltshire, the location of ancient stone circles. Sir Amory also remarks, You'd be surprised what lurks beneath the surface of some of those peaceful Cotswold hills. An apparent reference to the Severn Valley setting of Ramsay Campbell's early mythos tales. 250 million years ago. The Shagath originally created to be nothing more than a mindless workforce controlled through hypnotic suggestion, the Shagas by this time slowly evolved a certain sentience, became dissatisfied with their place in society, and rose up against their masters. Whilst this rebellion was quickly put down by the Elder Things and their advanced technology, the destruction of the Shagas was by this point not an option. The Elder Things had come to rely too heavily on their creations for their civilization to function without them. 225 million years ago. The dinosaurs evolved and destroyed the serpent people's civilization. Although the ancient civilization of Volusia was destroyed, many serpent people survived. They fled underground, hiding until the world became more hospitable once more. The greatest of the serpent people's underground civilizations was Yath, located deep below what is now North America. For over 200 million years, serpent people dwelled there. Their civilization rose and fell a hundred times. 150 million years ago. The great race of Yith foils a Yacubian invasion attempt. Sometime thereafter, the tablets later known as the Eltdown Shards, which record this event, are buried in modern-day southern England. This knowledge was introduced in the challenge from beyond. Next is a brief summary of its events. The Challenge from Beyond On an August night, a man named George Campbell was camping out in a Canadian forest until he heard a faint noise and attempted to throw a rock at the creature. But he stopped and saw that the rock he picked up was a cube-shaped quartz crystal that held a disc inside inscribed with peculiar cuneiform writing. He began to think to himself where this unusual crystal came from, possibly from the times of Sumeria or back further until he decided to get some rest, even when putting out the light revealed the crystal's own afterglow for a brief moment. However, the thought kept him awake. After hours unable to sleep, he saw that the crystal was still showing luminescence, and felt like it was drawing him in. The crystal's markings began to change, and a voice was heard luring George in. Sounds were heard from it, and with all the curious nature, he decided to gaze upon it for any change. Upon applying torchlight, the cube's cuneiform markings formed the shape of objects, music was heard, and the cube started slowly melting, and the disc was growing. Panicked, George attempted to look away but was dragged into the disc that had now become a globe. He found himself sucked into the unknown grey misty void produced by the globe, and woke up in an incorporeal form unable to touch or feel cold. However, his thinking capability was heightened, as he recalled reading about clay fragments called out down shards from precarboniferous strata in southern England thirty years before, earning their name for how it baffled their discoverers for predating humanity and looking artificial. He then recalled a time in 1912 when Arthur Brooke Winters Hall, an occultist Sussex clergyman, had identified the out down shards as consistent with prehuman hieroglyphs cherished in certain mystical circles publishing a translation that told a story about a race of worm-like beings with night-unlimited nature control, mastered interstellar travel very early, and inhabited every habitable planet in their galaxy while exterminating every other race they found. However, they could not go beyond their galaxy in person, and discovered they could transfer their minds beyond their galaxy with the use of energized crystals containing hypnotic talismans that could form ethereal bridges for mental communication and when applied light and attention could activate it. Upon this, 
the individual would be sent to the worm's homeworld and become incorporeal inside a machine connected to the cubes until examination, getting the machine pumped of its contents and being interrogated via mind interchange, as the worm would then occupy the individual's own unconscious body and explore the individual's world, and then return via the same transfer process when exploration is concluded with no harm to the individual. But in some cases, the worms would capture and annihilate races capable of space travel. In other cases, they would permanently inhabit planets and other galaxies after exterminating their occupant beings, but they could never replicate their own homeworld due to the lack of proper materials, as the cubes could only be made on their own planet. But the process by which outer individuals came across the cubes were so rare that only three accounts of this had occurred, counting the one that arrived on Earth 150 million years ago. Dr. Winters Hall wrote that the Earth was once occupied by cone-shaped aliens which had a mentality so advanced they could mentally expand across time and space as well. The race's leader recognized the danger and had the possessed individuals destroyed, regardless of the well-being of the displaced lost occupant minds. They dubbed the cube a menace, and hid it away at a special shrine posing as a relic, not destroying it due to seeing experimental possibilities. The worms attempted a counter-strike for their lost explorers, but it never came to pass as the cube was lost during a war that destroyed the polar city holding it, while the race itself would flee due to a threat from inner Earth. Having trouble processing this situation, Campbell found himself in the body of one of these alien worms as he was strapped inside of a lab to be examined by another, as he struggled with his new body's alien physiology. However, he soon pondered the endless possibilities and how immortal a consciousness could be while the body it inhabits is finite and could be cast off for another, soon coming to embrace the new planet that he discovered was called Yekub through the mind exchange of the consciousness who currently had his human body, Toth. He had all of Toth's memories of this planet, and it changed his perception. He understood the Yakubian's language as the entering Yakubian, Yuk the Supreme Lord of Science but he attacked him with his own scientific equipment, killing him. He ran and found himself quickly accustomed to his new body thanks to Toad's memories. He entered a domed room with livid blue lights, an iridescent metal floor, and a structure with tiers of vivid colors that housed the translucent ivory-like sphere, whom Campbell knew was the god of Yekub Jekshab, whose reasons for fear were lost to time. He was met by a Yakubian priest who was horrified that Campbell touched Jukshab's spire, something unheard of in Yakub culture, and Campbell abruptly killed him. Blinded by his sudden lust for power, Campbell climbed the tiers and disturbed Jukshab, grabbing the sphere intent on gaining its power, turning it blood red, escaping outside with it. He crawled onto a large throne and proudly held the sphere. Juk claimed that a human body was too primitive for a Yakubian mind to control and only a human consciousness could balance it out, and any worm who inhabits a human body will be victimized by feral primitive predatory instinct. Campbell began to rule wisely with the power he now possessed. Back on Earth, Toad, inside Campbell's body, walked out of the tent and saw the night sky and aurora borealis. However, he could not accommodate to the human body as he drooled on amber saliva, and while he soon learned to stand erect, it was not in a consistent manner, and he regressed into a feral monstrous form. He found himself trying to kill a silver fox instinctively as food, dying and washing out into a lake to be found by a lost trapper man. 100 million years ago. Height of the Elder Things Civilization. This excerpt of the Necronomicon describes their peak of civilization. The City of Heights, as it may be called, is the original home of the Elder Race, more ancient even than the Old Ones, who traveled to our world long before the creation of man. Here they erected a new city in imitation of that familiar place, and this second home may still be seen in its ghostly outlines in the mists on the plateau of Ling. As monumental as it appears to human eyes, it is but a low and unworthy shadow of the original, which shimmers beneath the heat of three suns on their distant world. Whether this place can be reached in the body is unknown, although some have said that by means of certain angles that cut channels through the substance of space itself, and by the careful preparation of the flesh with herbal concoctions, 
travel is to be had to this distant world without recourse to soul flight. But whether a living man could survive such a flight can only be demonstrated by the attempt. The bodies of the elder ones appear awkward and unnatural to our perceptions, yet they move with rapidity on their five lower limbs with splayed feet triangular in shape. Their gray trunks are leathery and hard to the touch, and are ribbed with vertical ridges. From them extend flexible arms that are much like the branches of a tree. Between the ridges expand translucent gray wings that open from the bottom to the top like a fan. They enable flight both through air and the emptiness between the stars, and their rhythmic beatings speed the progress of these creatures underwater. At times the inhabitants open them to the rays of their suns to enjoy the warmth. The eyesight of these monsters is excellent, but because it permits seeing both before and behind, to which men are unaccustomed, it requires a period of acclimatization before it may be used to good effect. The immediate impression is that of one image laid on top of another, as though a painter had executed a second work of art directly on top of the first in such a way that both could be seen. After a short while this disorientation of the eyes passes, and they serve as admirable instruments with which to appreciate the beauty of the city. Although the city of heights has no proper name recognized by our race, it might well be called the city of colors, so resplendent is the light of this world. The largest sun is red, that of middle size yellow, and the smallest, which is scarcely bigger than Venus at her nearest approach, is a blazing bluish white that cannot be looked upon without the eyes of the inhabitants becoming dazzled. These three colors interact without being blended, so that one moment the sky is pink, the next blue, the next a delicate shade of green, and so on, changing with rapidity from one hue to the next, and making all that is seen in the city below seem to dance and flicker with the reflected rays of finely cut jewels. The bright towers are tall beyond the power of the mind to comprehend, for their tops are set within the clouds, yet from a distance they do not appear so high for they are not slender spires such as we are accustomed to make when we wish to project a building into the heavens, but of massive thickness and square corners. So finely set are the stones, these soaring artificial mountains appear to be carved from single blocks. Their uncivil shapes defy the earth, for some are wider at the tops than at their bases, and have immense flat surfaces upon which the elder ones promenade and converse with one another in their shrill piping voices that sound much as do our flutes. They excel in pictorial representation, but delight most in depicting their own forms, as though their very shape were to them a holy thing, or that by reproducing it in their paintings and carvings they could draw assurance from it as from something perfect in an imperfect universe. Everywhere it adorns their walls, their fountains, even the balustrades of their high balconies, for they love the heights and seldom venture into the shadows between the bases of their buildings, or into the dense jungle that lies at the borders of this vast city. It may be for this reason that it has acquired the title City of Heights among the deep dwellers of our world and the few men who converse with them. Paintings in their numerous galleries show their coming to our world when both its dry surface and its seas were still devoid of life, so that not a blade of grass grew upon the lands and no fish swam in the waters. They are equally at home in water or air, and took their initial abode upon our world under the waves as a living place less hostile to their flesh than the harsh rays of our sun, which in that ancient time was hotter and more burning. It was this very harshness of the sun that prevented the growth of life on the rocks. Not that our sun is brighter than the three suns of their heavens, but as they say in conversation between themselves while gazing at images of our world, because our higher zone of air lacks a barrier to the rays that weakens their force. To make the oceans more pleasant, the Elder Ones created many types of living things. When long eons had passed, and our air became thicker, plants began to grow upon the rocks, and later still, insects crawled and flew among them. The Elder Ones emerged from the waves and built their new city, where Ling now resides beyond the mountains of the east. For a period of time much greater than the existence of our race, they lived untroubled, pursuing their studies and creations for they are curious creatures who seek to know all the mysteries of the worlds they have opened. Then came the armies of Cthulhu that drove them back into the seas and destroyed their city. After the passage of a span of time that cannot be measured by our mathematicians, 
since there is no word for so large a number of years, the Elder Ones again emerged from the depths and built a new city upon the ruined foundation of the old, in the land that lies at the southernmost extremity of our world. For over time this land had floated upon the great subterranean ocean from the north to the south. Here they remained until the coming of the ice, when they again returned to the sea. All these matters are to be gathered from their paintings and their speech with each other, but not easily, for the bodies of the Elder Ones cannot be controlled as can the bodies of most other vessels. They do not appear to resist the effort to make them walk this way or that, but merely to be unaware of it. However, from certain amused remarks that pass between them, it is likely that they know when they are inhabited by a visiting soul traveler, but that this occurrence is of so little importance that they choose to ignore it. Much of their time is expended in intellectual discussion, for their minds are keener than those of any other living being attainable through the portals. Yet they also delight in describing among themselves various bloody tortures inflicted on several kinds of living things bred expressly for this purpose. Torture is to them a form of high art and their chief recreation. The creatures who suffer to amuse them are bred to enhance their sensitivity to pain, so that their writings are more strenuous. The quality of the artistry and the entertainment, for it is both, is determined by how severe it can be made without cutting short the life of the performer. A blasphemous thing must be written, the utterance of which would cause outrage and death in both the lands of the prophet and those of the cross. It is whispered that the elder ones, who are skilled in the making of all manner of things both inert and living, are the creators of mankind. They made numerous forms of life to fill up the barren lands of our world, and we were only one among many. Why they created us is unknown to our scholars, nor has it been heard uttered by the Elder Ones, but it should be considered that when they refer to mankind in their conversations it is always with a kind of piping laughter, as though the mere mention of our name amuses them. It is perhaps no accident that in our anatomy the organs of reproduction are combined with the organs of excretion whereas these organs are widely separated on the bodies of the Elder Ones. 65 million years ago. The extinction of the dinosaurs. 50 million years ago. Third Cataclysm. The polyps rose up and exterminated the great race, afterwards returning to their subterranean haunts. Having no conception of light, the polyps seemed content to remain there, annihilating the few intruders that chance upon them. The entrances to their dwellings are mostly deep within ancient ruins where there are great wells sealed over with stone. Inside these wells still dwell the polyps. The great race then which sends its greatest minds to bodies on the planet Jupiter. From Jupiter, the Yithians proceed to bodies similar to their earthly ones on a world orbiting a dark star near Taurus. The great race of Yith saw their own downfall in the future eventually swapping minds in the future with a beetle race existing after humanity's extinction. Many Elder Things cities are also destroyed, including their original settlement in Antarctica. To replace it, a new Antarctic city is constructed. This time marks the beginning of the decline of the Elder Civilization and the end of the Elder Age.